couple of weeks ago, I did a video on the most common mistakes that beginners make when doing Amazon FBA. And thinking about it, I thought it would be really helpful for you to not only understand those types of mistakes, but what about the mistakes that I've actually made myself? So in this video, we're gonna be talking about the mistakes that I've made over the past two years, as well as my friend Ella, who I met through Amazon FBA. We've done a video together before and we got quite a bit of good feedback. So I thought, let's get together, let's talk about the real genuine mistakes that we've made so that we can ensure that you guys don't make them moving forwards. So let's get straight into it. So let's start off with maybe one of your mistakes. Uh, just <laughs> <laughs> obviously because you, you're so so close to perfection that like nine of these are just my failures, just one after the other. I think like a sort of a, a big a big one that a lot of people face is like just kind of getting really really emotional and getting emotionally attached to a product. Um, I do it like the whole time you look at product research, you, it's as if you like you see something and then you see like 10 steps in front of you, which is really, really good. But at the same time, you then kind of like, you almost want to force it through and force it to work. You'll be like, yeah, there's loads of competitors, but that doesn't matter. And you're like, and so you just kind of start, well, for me anyway, I start to get a bit blindsided and just kind of get really overexcited about things when I should actually be more practical about it. It is really difficult, especially when you're new to product research and you're just starting and maybe you come across a product or this is actually what I did to be honest so um, the product that I found was a posture corrector which is now a product that I kind of say to people it's way oversaturated just don't go anywhere near it um, but I found it I saw the sales figures were great and I was thinking of like a brand name and I thought perfect posture that sounds great and already I had all ideas in my mind about the logo and the branding and all things like that and I got so um, emotionally attached to the idea like just in I just invested all myself into it and I was just you know kind of thinking this is going to be great I'm going to do this and that and then when I started to like look at the data that's when it kind of became a bit more obvious to me that it wasn't worth progressing with but I also found at the same time, I was like, no, I've thought of this really good logo idea. I've thought of this um, cool like branding that I can do. I need to like go ahead with it. And I think it wasn't until I was probably about to order the sample that I kind of thought, actually, hang on, Janssen, the data is saying no. You kind of need to <laughs> try and separate the two. Spent your whole life like like abiding by the data as well. So that must exactly. be exactly. I'm a I'm a data man. So yeah. as soon as I saw that, I was like, maybe not. What would be your advice then to people doing Amazon FBA in terms of trying to avoid being emotionally attached or doing a product because you just kind of think well I have to have invested all this time it's really really difficult isn't it because obviously yeah. you need to be emotionally invested to care but at the same time you need to be aware that there's like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of products that just because you've got attached to one doesn't necessarily mean it's like the one I think the idea of the one needs to go away it's difficult but I suppose you've got to just kind of be very focused on the fact that if the data says it's not going to work, don't try and convince yourself because of the time that you spent on it previously. Okay, so let's now go on to the second mistake that we've made. Uh, now, this was when I very first started getting into Amazon FBA and I decided that I wanted to sell a product in a gated category. And my logic there was, well, if I can sell in a category that is gated, it means it will be less competitive and I'll find it easier to basically take all the sales and make all the money. So um, the advice that I was given at the time by my mentor was that the um, beauty category was gated and you have to spend something like a hundred pounds, I think, from a wholesaler to get um, items within the beauty niche. And then you then have to get the invoice from that wholesaler and send it to Amazon to basically like show proof that you have um, items in stock and that you um, that, and that these items are actually within the beauty category. So I was like, okay, great. So I registered an account with a wholesaler, and I think I spent about 125 pounds on 10 um, packets of uh, toothpaste and then 15 like mint shower gel, like the cheapest mint shower gel going, you know, like the- That sounds proper nasty. <laughs> it was really nasty, yeah. I mean, my, I just kind of thought, I'm just doing this to basically be able to, as a gateway to get into a niche that I can then, you know, make a lot of money from. So anyway, I got all the um, stock, waited it for it to come through the post. I think I paid like 30 quid in postage as well, because it was a lot of stuff. And um, it came, I got the invoice, I like so excited, went onto Amazon, logged on, 
was just about to press apply and then the apply button wasn't even there and it was basically like the beauty category isn't even gated anymore they'd like ungated it like two months before so oh. i was just like brilliant i've just spent like nearly 150 pounds 30 pounds of which was on postage for shower gel toothpaste and this like soap and um, so that was two years ago and genuinely i've only just finished that rank shower gel this week it's taken me two years to get through it i mean so, that deserves a celebration in itself doesn't it it was yeah i like treating myself yeah, now to, um, shower gel you can now yeah. have a shower gel again that doesn't burn <laughs> yeah exactly no mint and it's a proper brand i've gone for links now i think as a bit of a treat um but my so it was a mistake on my part because what i should have done i mean amazon is a changing beast they're always changing their rules um, and like the terms and conditions and all that jazz. So what I should have done before making any decisions was just logged onto the Amazon website and just have had a look at the like latest rules, so to speak. In fact, it always seems like Amazon are constantly changing which categories are gated and which ones aren't. So my recommendation is before you even think about selling a certain product, you should always try and actually list it first, just to double check that it's not gated, restricted, classed as hazmat, banned, or anything else that might actually stop you from being allowed to sell it with Amazon. Okay, so number three of the mistakes that we've made, this one relates to spending all of your initial investment on stock and not saving anything left over um, for the listing process and your images. Though this isn't a mistake that we've made, so to speak, um, Ella and I run a company called The Listing Company where we help people with their images and just putting their listing together to ensure that it's really optimized. And that is definitely something that we see quite frequently with people. They'll say to us, um, I've just got my first order, it's just arrived, I've spent all my money, I've got um, you know, 20 pounds to do my images and my um, list, put my listing together, can you help? And we always kind of say to people, you need definitely to leave more than that. I mean, what would you say minimum, Ella, in your experience for getting all your images done and basically think, ensuring your listing is fully optimized? I would say, I think for myself, I left a, I had a budget of 500 quid to get, to get everything done. I think I did it for about 400 in the end because um, I got some really good renders done. And even though I could have done the infographics myself at that point because it was my first product, I didn't. Based on my experience, I would actually say 500 is the the top end. I mean, it depends again on your own experience and the equipment you've got. So what I did with my first product is instead of having renders done, I basically I used my friend's DSLR camera. I went to Donnell Mill and I bought, which is like a hardware store, and I bought like plastic flowers because my product was in the beauty niche. I bought like plastic flowers. Um, I went to a tile shop and bought a tile and then kind of just put that down. It's like a big marble tile and um, put that down um, put the product on it, put the uh, flowers in the background and took all the pictures myself. And those actually came out really well. And I had so many compliments from people saying, I really like your photos. Like, where did you get them done? And I was just like, I just did them myself. So, and that didn't cost me much at all. But yeah, I mean, you can, you can get people on Upwork to do editing and you can get us as well to do editing from say a hundred pounds. So I mean, the, the main takeaway point here is don't leave like barely any money spend all your money on stock because you could have the best product in the world right but if you're listing and your photos aren't there to convince the customer and like compel them to buy from you then it doesn't really matter how good your product is okay so the fourth mistake and this one actually comes from me and it's a topic that i've spoken about quite recently on my youtube channel is about over negotiating with a supplier and basically sacrificing quality. Now this is actually something that I did with my first product. My first product was doing really, really well and I was just determined to increase my profit margins as high as I could. They, the margins were actually pretty good on my first order. I think they were still like between 30 and 35%, um, but like Greedy Jansen just like, just, you know, kind of got in the way and I ended up negotiating with the supplier and basically getting a price that I thought, wow, that's really good. It increased my margins to like four, 40 to 45%. And what happened um, was I basically got the um, new, new order, came to Amazon, and within like one month or so, I just started getting loads of negative reviews and refund requests from people, basically saying the quality was really shoddy, it didn't work, it broke after a couple of weeks, and that 
like genuinely was all because of me over negotiating. I think what happened is I just basically forced the supplier to either switch their own um, like components supplier themselves or just turn to a cheap like type of material or something. Um, and it basically just ended up like ruining the product because my review score fell from like four and a half all the way to four. I was getting like refund requests all the time. I think Amazon even said to me, um, you need to basically put a plan of action together or tell us what like mitigants you're going to do to make sure this doesn't happen again. And in the end, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to start again. I'm going to put that product on hold, improve it, find a new supplier and start again. Essentially, it's being greedy and going, I want all of the profit. I want all of this. And it's obviously when you get caught up in it, you're like, oh my God, I can make this and I can make this. And you're yeah. not satisfied with that level because there's always like something else above it. I think it's very, very difficult not to do the same thing. But yeah, because you always think the lower the price I can pay, the better. But it just it doesn't really work like that. And it's a trade off, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be some leeway to negotiate with a supplier. But when you're starting to get a discount of like 15, 20 percent upwards, that's when you need to question to yourself, why? What am I sacrificing here? Why is the supplier agreeing to it? And it's obvious, in my case, it was obviously because the supplier was like, okay, well, we can maybe miss that bit out in the production line, or we can switch that material to a cheaper one. And it just didn't work out. The next mistake, and to be honest, this isn't really a mistake. This is, I suppose, just maybe an oversight. Um, we, and it was something that was really, really good that happened to Ella's product. So Ella basically like did not do anything special, but somehow got a YouTuber with how many subscribers was it? Two million. Two million subscribers. They bought her product and they promoted it on YouTube for free. With You didn't even know, did you? I, what, what happened? You just saw an absolute ton of sales come through. I was on a plane and then I think my sales for that week had just been really bad so I was kind of annoyed every time I opened the app I was just getting really <laughs> so you know when you swipe and you're like please oh, yeah please have please have some a really bad couple of weeks and I was just like I was just feeling really disheartened by it and then got on a plane and then like obviously the first thing I did when I landed was like get the Amazon app out just in case I think it was like two o'clock in the morning UK time or something and I swiped it and I was just like I've sold 57 units like it's like, got to be a mistake like how's that happened like that's so weird um and then and then the next day it just kept going up and kept going up I remember i was messaging you and we were just like what because like there was no actual direct link to i've seen this and this happened i was just yeah. like is it an algorithm thing or something like what's happened you're on the first page yeah i mean that can happen but not like from, to go from like say five to eight sales a day to 60 was it like, well, how many did you do in the end was it 70 or something um well i ended up the prop the <laughs> I mean, it's a good problem to have, I guess. I didn't actually have that much left in stock before I was getting yeah. 100 or something left. So it was a pretty bad time. But then I guess, yeah. I'll put, like the pace I was going, I reckon I could have easily sold like over a thousand of them in that well, time. So we've just looked this up together. Tell the guys how many views this video has got now, which literally is just promoting your products. Yeah, 670,000. And it's a half an hour video of um, the YouTuber literally using my product. Um, That's amazing. Talking about how I suppose the mistake there was the fact that we've not really used influencers to their full potential. I mean, even you might think, yeah, but it might cost a lot of money. But I think a lot of these guys might just be happy to promote the product for free if they think it'll be really useful for them. Like, for example, the one that bought Ella's, like, she didn't ask for any money. I mean, some of these influencers reach out, don't they? And they're like, please can I have the product for free and I'll promote it but she she didn't she actually just bought it and just genuinely really liked it yeah which is insane and obviously recognize that with some products like it made a good youtube video like regardless of whether you're going to use the product or not but i think there are so 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 many influencers there now that i don't that there will be people that you can get reasonable prices from yeah with influencers, i think you just need to weigh it up because sometimes obviously if you're going to massive influencers they, get, they are going to ask for big money if they've got agents and managers and stuff um, so you need to weigh up that obviously if you've just started out and ordered 500 units, then, you know, probably getting an influencer isn't the right stage for you. But if you're in the process of trying to, you know, grow off Amazon and build up the brand as a whole, then I think it's a really, really, really good way to go. 
Okay, so the last mistake that we're going to discuss, one that I made initially, I'm not actually sure if Ella did, and that is getting a mentor or just joining like an Amazon FBA community, immersing yourself in the community in order to learn as much as possible. Now, my background, how I kind of found about Amazon FBA, was just came across a video on YouTube, and then I thought, I'm just going to do, I, I was really interested in the model and I thought, I'm just going to do this alone. I don't need anyone else's help. I, I've sold things on eBay before. I know how to do it. And that was, I think, in December 2017. And by May 2018, I just hadn't done anything. I'd made no progress. I, I didn't have anybody to help me, guide me, give me the motivation. So I think at that point, that's when I kind of realized that I'd made a bit of a mistake there. I wasn't really in any of the any of the Amazon FBA groups on Facebook I didn't have a mentor I didn't have like um, a course to follow or anything like that um, and I think it was actually the last week in May I mentioned it in my previous video the last week of May I got a mentor I got a course I joined as many Facebook groups as I could um, to do with Amazon FBA and that is when my, my knowledge suddenly went like that because every time I was coming on Facebook I was seeing other people's stories other people's mistakes and their lessons and then obviously I had a mentor to be able to ask about Amazon FBA and I had a course as well so that was probably one of the biggest ones that I think actually realistically delayed me getting involved and getting started with Amazon FBA for as much as five months. Definitely. I think when you say the Facebook group thing, it's so amazing how much you don't realize that how much you immerse yourself in it. Um, like every time you just flick on Facebook, um, you just be, see someone's see someone's question and then you just see someone else answer it. And without actually making much effort at all, you've just learned something new without even realizing it. Um, so I thought that was really, really powerful. But um, for me, I just kind of acknowledged that like, all my experience from working in TV was always working in teams. Like I've never really worked, done something solely on my own. I've always preferred working with other people. I've always worked well with others. Um, so I kind of, yeah. And same is to me, I feel it's like, it's the same as getting a personal trainer. Like you can get a six pack on your own, but you're going to get there quicker. Oh, I, I certainly can't. I've tried many <laughs> times. <laughs> Um, but for me, like, I need someone physically staring at me to do the exercise. Like, I know that I'm more than capable of doing it on my own. Yeah, yeah. I won't do it well unless I've got someone literally going, no, do it. And I feel like when you, like, sign up for a course or have a mentor, um, it's the same sort of effect. Even though they're not, like, telling you every single day, you kind of put it on yourself that it's something you have to do. Um, so yeah. I agree with you. I mean, there's been quite a few videos this week. I don't know what's happened, but a number of videos talking about um, courses and mentors and gurus and stuff like that. Um, and I had a conversation with somebody uh, this morning, actually, about um, whether it, I thought it was worth them getting it. And I always say, to be honest, I think there's no right or wrong answer for, to that question. I think it depends on the individual and the experience they've got, their level of motivation, their level of free time. Um, the way that I actually um, talked about it to this person was I said, it's a bit like climbing a mountain and you've got a guidebook that tells you how to get up and, and do it. So you can just read that yourself and you can just go up and, and do it alone. Or alternatively, you can um, do that in addition to having like a Sherpa for somebody, somebody that knows all the shortcuts and knows the bits to avoid and the dangerous parts and can easily guide you and tell you what's coming up next and what's around the corner and things like that so it's perfectly possible to climb the mountain with and without a sherpa and just with your own like guidebook but i suppose depending on the person and their level of confidence and motivation and how much experience they've got they might much prefer having that sherpa yeah. See what I mean? Or is that? No, no, that's a really, really profound analogy. Uh, yeah, I thought so too. I was like, wow, Johnson, that was, that was beautiful. I that one out of the park with this one. No, it's, it's very, it's, it is, but it is very true. And I think a lot of bad things are said about courses for the wrong reasons. I, there are lots of things out there that totally are totally legit. I feel like get tarred with this negative brush because of some people that don't have experience who have just put together a course to try and like you know throw some ads out and get some money there are people that do that so I feel like anyone who's going to be your mentor just make sure like you've spoken with them and you feel like you've sort of vetted out that they're they are who they say yeah they're. agree completely agree completely just do your like diligence ensure that that yeah the person actually sells that the materials that they use to teach Amazon are updated because I, as I mentioned earlier um, the materials that I did on the course that I took hadn't been updated and um, because of that I found that 
I was buying toothpaste and shower gel when I didn't need to do that. I mean, again, as I mentioned earlier, I, I still should have checked the, um, the Amazon website to like check what the latest was. Um, but also I think, yeah, if you're going to buy a course and enroll with a mentor, make sure the materials are up to, up to date and make sure that that mentor does actually know what they're talking about and does actually sell with Amazon. Okay guys, so that's enough now. We're gonna stop talking about the mistakes that we've made. That's it, we've done no more mistakes. They're just- that's So many mistakes every single day, but that's okay. I think, it's, I think it's, it's important to say the mistakes are totally fine. Like everyone makes mistakes every day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been doing, I've been doing Amazon for two years now and I still do things. In fact, I did one the other day, I wasn't gonna mention this one and it was just, I um, have got goods on the way to the fulfillment center. I created my shipping plan and I don't know what that, what I did. I just deleted the shipping plan for some reason. And I was like, no, no, my goods are going to disappear into the ether. And I was like, Oh God, like, what do I do? And in your stomach where you go, <laughs> yeah, I was actually like, brilliant. I've just lost a thousand units. But anyway, I spoke with Amazon seller central and they were like, it's fine. And just basically pressed an undo button. So um, yeah, that's just like a way of saying that, everyone makes mistakes i make mistakes like just everyone does don't worry about it what is important is that you learn from it and improve and you use mentors guides like me to try and ensure that mistakes that we've made don't happen to you either so thank you very much for tuning in guys if you did like this video with ella please remember to give a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel um, otherwise i will see you next time for another amazon fba tutorial video